Morning everyone, thank you so much to Rick and the AIC for inviting me here today. I've really enjoyed the first day and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conference. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the extent to which we could or should reposition the offender in our consideration for what works in crime prevention through environmental design. So I got through the first slide, I remembered who I am and I remembered the title, so that is a very good start. Just a brief overview of the focus of the presentation. Um, as I said, the crime prevention measure that I'm focusing on is crime prevention through environmental design, otherwise referred to at times as SIPTED. Um, I'm aware that there'll be a really different level of knowledge of what SIPTED is in the room. So if I'm talking uh, too basic or too complicated about it, then please feel free to come and ask me any more questions afterwards. Um, there was an excellent session yesterday on SIPTED which covered some of the things uh, which I will be going over again today. But SIPTED is a crime prevention measure which aims to reduce crime through the design of places and spaces. Uh, it can apply to lots of different environments, so schools, universities, shopping centres. Uh, my presentation today is focusing on SIPTED within residential housing. Uh, it can focus on lots of different crime types, uh, but today I'm focusing on its effectiveness in reducing burglary. Um, the focus of the presentation is very much UK based, and I do apologise for that. Um, that's mainly because the research that I'm presenting took place in the UK, so I do want to give you a bit of context and background to what I'm presenting in terms of policy and practice so it makes sense. Um, so in, in line with the theme of the conference, I'm focusing on transforming evidence into practice. So what we do in terms of our practice in implementing SIPTED, uh, the policy and guidance that we have to support that implementation, and uh, more importantly, why we do it. So what evidence do we base what we do upon? And I'm going to be asking who or what informed that evidence. So what data did we collect? Who did we collect it from? Did we continue to update that data, etc.? And I'm going to be concluding by asking whether or not we need to have a rethink about SIPTED in 2008 and 18. So start by looking at SIPTED, what it is. And again, I do apologise if people know this. Um, SIPTED is largely based upon a series of components or principles. Uh, there is different opinions on what these components or principles should be, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. In the UK, we, we largely use these principles uh, to inform our guidance and practice on SIPTED. So these are basically informal surveillance or natural surveillance, so ensuring that we have clear sight lines between properties, not blocking the sight lines with high hedges, high fences, high walls, etc. Uh, setting specific standards of physical security, so locks, bolts, windows, doors, etc. Um, Maximising what we call defensible space, so making sure it's clear who should and who shouldn't be in an area, clear demarcation between public and private space. Movement control, so limiting access and escape routes, so limiting the number of footpaths and pathways we have through developments. And managing and maintaining areas, so removing litter, removing graffiti, uh, giving the impression to potential offenders that we care about the area and if, if they commit a crime they will be observed, they will be noticed and they will be challenged. But who defined this? Who said that these were the principles of SIPTED? Um, well, I'm going to argue that this SIPTED has largely been defined by academics, such as myself, uh, with some consultation with practitioners, such as the police, particularly in the UK, who implement SIPTED, also with built environment professionals, such as planners, architects, etc. Um, I'd argue that there's been very little consultation on SIPTED with offenders, um, which is, is entirely remiss, really, given that these are the people who are attempting to overcome the measures that SIPTED puts in place. So this quote basically summarises the focus of this presentation. I'm going to be suggesting that by asking offenders and by listening to what the offenders tell us, we can get a better understanding of why they do what they do. Uh, we can better design our crime, uh, crime prevention policy and practice. And we can better establish whether or not what we're doing in terms of SIPTED actually works. So I'm not going to read the quote out, you can see that on the screen. 
So the theme of the conference is about translating evidence into practice. So I'm looking at what we do and why we do what we do. So I'm going to start by giving you a very brief overview on what we do in the UK in terms of SIPTED. Um, I hope you find this interesting. I'm not saying that this is a perfect and there'll be good and bad practice that you can take in terms of what we do. This is a very brief summary of what, how we implement SIPTED. So in the UK, every police force has a minimum of one, what we call a designing out crime officer. Um, I've put the other two terms there, architectural liaison officer and crime prevention design advisor, because we do uh, use these terms interchangeably. Uh, they used to be referred to as an architectural liaison officer. We've now tried to standardise it and they are all referred to as designing out crime officers, but it is the same job. And if you see uh, any of these terms, it is basically the same job. And I'll probably slip into using architectural liaison officer or crime prevention design advisor throughout the presentation. So they're called designing out crime officers now. A minimum of one in each force. At the moment, uh, about 75% of these are now police staff. So only about a quarter are sworn or warranted police officers. Uh, when I started working on SIPTED, as Rick revealed, about 20 years ago, which makes me a lot older than I'd like to admit, um, about 90 to 95%, I would say, were sworn police officers. So we've had a real move towards civilianising that role. So their job is basically to review all planning applications that come into a local authority, uh, whether that's for a housing development, a school, an ATM, a supermarket, etc. And to look at that and use their knowledge uh, of SIPTED and the SIPTED principles to decide whether or not that planning application can go ahead based upon crime risk. So they might accept that, they might ask for some changes, they might reject that application. Um, I was mentioning yesterday in the SIPTED session that we do have quite an innovative approach in that um, quite a large proportion of these will actually be based in the local authority planning department. So they will sit alongside the planning officer. Uh, they learn to speak the same language as the planning officer. They learn to understand the priorities that planning have, uh, which are aside from security. Some are still based within police stations, so we do have a, a mix in terms of delivery. Uh, something um, that I think is really important to note is that um, we've had a, a severe period of austerity in the UK. Um, our public sector has seen cuts of about a third since 2010. So police forces have seen a real drop in the number of police officers. And because designing out crime officers are not frontline police officers, they're not considered to be the most important or it's not particularly a sexy role or considered to be that important in the UK. We've seen a massive reduction. Uh, in 2009, we had about 350 of these covering the UK. We now have about 125 to 150, uh, which really influences the extent to which they can do the things that I'm going to be talking about here. Um, we, we have some police forces that have one um, I think Steve will agree there are some forces that are trying to get rid of the post entirely, which we're lobbying against, but it's just worth realising that this is, this is a, a diminishing role. So I'll just very quickly go through the legislation, regulation and planning policy that we have in place to ensure that we embed SIPTED within our planning system. So in terms of regulation, uh, in terms of legislation, we don't have any specific legislation that mandates the implementation of SIPTED, uh, but we do have the Crime and Disorder Act 1998, and I was very pleased to see somebody mention this yesterday, which was really exciting to, um, to know that you know about the Crime and Disorder Act. Um, Section 17 of that is particularly important um, for this field because... It places a duty on what we call responsible authorities, and that includes uh, the police and also our local authorities who deal with planning. Uh, it places a responsibility on them to consider the implications of every of, on crime and disorder of every decision that they make. So you have a, a local authority that makes decisions on planning policy, uh, whether you have a, a new housing estate, whether you have a new supermarket, and they're required, as part of this Act, to consider the implications of saying yes to that planning application 
upon crime and disorder. So it's a really important act and section 17 of it is a really important part. In terms of building regulations in England uh, since 2015, we now have a requirement for security within our building regulations. So for all new houses, um, there is a requirement to be built to a certain level of physical security. Just to um, remind you that this is just the physical security part of SIPTED, so it's not that design and layout, it's just the, the standard of the doors, the windows, the locks, etc. Um, we've had building regulations in Scotland for quite a long time. We don't have these in Wales, Northern Ireland yet, but I'm hoping that that's going to change. In terms of policy, so we have a national planning policy framework which influences all planning decisions that are made across the UK. And as you'll see, this states that planning policy and decisions should aim to ensure that they create safe environments uh, where the fear of crime or crime and disorder don't undermine uh, the quality of life or social cohesion. So this basically means that every planning decision that's made in the UK has to follow this philosophy or this policy. We also have um, very specific guidance. I know Ghana touched upon this in the session yesterday, which guides local authorities, at, local authorities as to how they implement that planning policy framework. And you'll see that that specifically references the importance of designing out crime. And it also uh, references the importance of having uh, pre-planning pre application discussions with um, they use the term crime prevention design advisor, um, which is now designing our crime officer. So we have that specific guidance which tells you how to do what you do. Um, just to say these are little excerpts from those, there's loads of information in that guidance. And then at a local authority level, every local authority has to develop what's called a local plan, and that influences the planning decisions for that local authority area. And that has to be in line with that national planning policy framework, so they can't produce a local plan that goes against that. And here, this is where that designing out crime officer, who works very closely with the planning team, can try and get SIPTED embedded into that local plan, so they can try and influence it and get specific reference to the importance of SIPTED. I'm just going to take a drink. Um, we also have um, an incentive or an award scheme. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of the Secure by Design scheme. But this is a scheme um, and it's an award that's given to specific developments. So again, that might be a housing development, it might be a school, it might be a commercial area, which meet specific standards of SIPTED. So if they build to these certain standards, they can be called a Secure by Design development. Secure by Design, it's nearly 30 years old, I think, now. It was developed in 1989, and it's owned and managed by uh, a well, an organisation called Police Crime Prevention Initiatives, and it's delivered on a day-to-day -day basis by those designing out crime officers. So they're the ones that implement it, they're the ones that decide if a development is meeting that secure by design standard. Again, if anyone's got any specific questions, because I'm running through the policy, in the UK quite quickly so I can get to the, the main part of the presentation. Just come and have a chat with me afterwards. So uh, Secure by Design is, is in two, two levels. There's a part one and a part two. Part one is based upon those SIPTED principles of design and layout. So that defensible space, <coughs> natural surveillance, uh, limiting movement. And part two is all about those technical standards of physical security. So the standards of the doors, windows, locks, etc. To get full Secure by Design, you have to meet Section 1 and Section 2. Um, to get Part 2 or Silver Secure by Design, you just have to meet those physical security standards. And some developers and some developments do just go for Part 2 of Secure by Design for a variety of reasons. But to be full Secure by Design, you've got to go for the full, uh, the full element of SIPTED. So in terms of requiring Secure by Design in our policy, um, in the UK we did have a requirement for all social housing to be built to Secure by Design. Um, the Homes and Communities Agency, which is a, a regulator of all our social housing, 
had it specifically referenced in their standards of the housing that they build, um, which is extremely important given we know how vulnerable social housing is to burglary. Unfortunately, um, the same government that introduced austerity, and I'm not going to get political here, but I will anyway, um, they, they're extremely keen as well on deregulating the planning system, which I guess was uh, in, uh, about stimulate. They said it was about stimulating building, in ensuring that we have more houses. Um, they commissioned what we'd call a housing standards review in 2014, which reviewed all our standards and regulation of housing. And they withdrew the ability for the Homes and Communities Agency to require secure by design. Um, the social housing can still decide to be secure by design if they want to be, for whatever reason, but it's no longer a requirement in, the, in England. It's something that um, Steve Trigg, who's speaking this afternoon, and the team at Secure by Design are lobbying to try and return because this is, this is really bad news. Uh, the good news is uh, the UK is not just England, uh, which I need to remember as well as other people, and Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland still require Secure by Design in all social housing. So this is something that England really need to, to get back on track with. So that's what we do. A really quick run through. As I said, that's not the focus of the presentation. So any questions, ask me at the end or come and find me afterwards. So why do we do what we do? Um, translating evidence into practice. We know that this makes common sense. Yes, it seems that it, it's a good thing to do. Uh, but do we have evidence to back that up? So I'm going to look, uh, first of all, at Secure by Design and what evidence we have for the effectiveness of this scheme. So I'm currently working with University College London on a systematic review of Secure by Design. Uh, Lorraine mentioned systematic reviews yesterday. And this is where you bring together all the evidence that exists uh, evaluating that particular intervention. Um, and this is for the What Works crime re in Crime Reduction Toolkit, which again was mentioned yesterday. This is a screenshot of the website. Um, so they basically do systematic reviews and meta-analyses of lots of different crime prevention interventions. You see their CCTV, allegating, etc. Within about a month, there'll be one on here on Secure by Design. Um, I, they basically, one of the really interesting things about this is they present the evidence uh, against uh, a framework which is referred to as EMI. E double M I E, yeah, is that right? Yeah, that's Erin. Um, and so they're looking not just at the effect, so not just at the impact on crime, they're also looking at um, the moderators and the mechanisms, so the context in which that intervention works best. Uh, they're also looking at implementation issues, so does it work better when implemented in a certain way? And they also present evidence on the cost, so is it a cost effective crime prevention measure? So as I said, there'll be one on Secure by Design within the next month or so. We have currently reviewed over 300 studies that reference the effectiveness of Secure by Design. Unfortunately, only seven of those 300 actually present primary quantitative uh, evidence on the impact of Secure by Design. So the others are talking about it as an initiative, perhaps referring to other studies, but they don't present primary data. So these are the studies that do present data on the effectiveness of Secure by Design. Um, and there are issues with these seven. Um, as you'll see, some of them are old, uh, 1994, 1999. Uh, Secure by Design, uh, something that I didn't mention, is that it is a standard that changes. So it changes every couple of years. The, particularly the physical security standards will improve as locks, uh, doors, windows improve. So what Secure by Design was in 1994 or 1999 isn't what it is in 2018. So that's one of the issues with these studies. The other issue is that some of them, uh, particularly the, bottom, the second to bottom, only evaluates um, part two of Secure by Design. So how effective is that physical security part of it, as opposed to the full SIPTED um, element of Secure by Design, which is what Secure by Design is. But having said that, um, 
the early indications of the systematic review, and I can't see it changing because it's going to be out in a couple of weeks, show that for Secure by Design that is new build, so as opposed to being refurbished to Secure by Design, uh, and Lorraine mentioned some of the weaknesses of uh, using a pre and post evaluation. So these are all new builds secure by design that are compared with a non-secure by design control. The early indications is that for the secure by design group, uh, burgl burglary within that group is 54% less likely. Um, so just reminding you that this is bringing together all the evidence that exists on the effectiveness of secure by design. Uh, and also reminding you that this is about the effectiveness of secure by design, not SIPTED. So it's, it has to have a secure by design award to be included in this. Um, one of the other issues with those uh, evaluations is that, they, as I'm sure you'll all know, they don't always give you the detail that you might want in terms of the methodology that they used, which makes it quite difficult for us to assess the rigour and the methodological rigour of those studies. So I'm going to very briefly give you a little bit more detail on one of the studies because I know about it because I was involved in it with a colleague, uh, Leanne Monchuk. So this was an evaluation of Secure by Design in the, uh, the force that I live in, West Yorkshire. If you hadn't been able to tell that I'm from Yorkshire, then uh, that's just a little giveaway. Um, so West Yorkshire is in the north of England. Um, so this evaluation included lots of different strands. Uh, we evaluated police recorded crime data. We conducted surveys with residents. We did visual audits to see what kind of evidence we could see on visible crime and disorder. Um, I'm just going to present a couple of strands of that evidence because it would be a presentation in itself. So the first strand was what we call most recent. So that was the secure by design developments that had been built in the most recent year to allow enough time for residents to have moved in and enough time for us to have a three-year period of crime data for the evaluation. So we took that and we compared that with the rest of West Yorkshire minus the secure by design development. So it's not the most rigorous method of, of conducting an evaluation, but it gives you a rough idea of what your secure by design crime rate is compared to your force average. And this showed us that for that sample of secure by design developments, the burglary rate was 5.8 per thousand dwellings, and the West Yorkshire average minus secure by design housing, the burglary rate was 22.7 per thousand. So, as I said, that's not the most rigorous methodology, but it gives us a, a quick indication of how well secure by design is performing in West Yorkshire. A better method of evaluation, and I don't think Lorraine's here anymore, but she'd be saying that this is how we should do an evaluation, is what we called um, same street. So because of our planning policies, um, where we have a private housing development of a certain size, there is a requirement, or there was a requirement, for a proportion of that to be social housing. And so we had a situation where we had a certain number of housing developments, in this case it was 11, which were half private housing, which was non-secure by design, and half was social housing, which was secure by design. So we had 11 housing developments, which were almost a perfect experiment in terms of it's the same housing estate, some secure by design and some non-secure by design. Um, of course, the tenure is different, but it, it's very difficult to do anything about that in terms of uh, conducting this sort of evaluation. So again, this showed really positive findings for Secure by Design. Um, in the Secure by Design sample, there were 118 crimes per thousand dwellings, no burglaries in that period of the evaluation. In the non-Secure by Design, we had 263 crimes per thousand and 14 burglaries per thousand. So. Uh, it, sh it showed extremely positive results. So this has been published and I can point you to the papers or if you want to come and chat to me afterwards. So that's Secure by Design. Thinking a bit more broadly about SIPTED in general and the individual components of SIPTED, um, there's been lots of uh, research showing the effectiveness of those different principles that I mentioned. 
I'm going to give you a really quick overview of a, a research project that we conducted for the Home Office in England, which broke down all those specific principles of SIPTED and looked at which were impacting most upon crime. So this was a really rigorous uh, study where we manually, um, I say we, uh, Leanne basically <laughs> went out um, and did and collected information on 31 specific design features uh, specific to the property. So this might be, uh, is it detached, is it semi-detached, is it terraced? How many windows does it have facing the street? Uh, what room is at the front of the house? Is it a bathroom, a bedroom, a living room? Uh, 19 design features specific to the wider development. So is it a cul-de-sac? Is it a through road? Are there footpaths on that development? Uh, what level of lighting do you have on the development? And that data were manually collected for over 2,000 houses uh, across um, 12 developments, three police forces. Um, we then collected the police recorded crime data for three years and compared those design features with the crimes experienced at those dwellings. Again, this has been published and I can give you those papers or you can come and ask me the questions about it. The main, because I'm just going to give you the headlines from it, um, the main significant design features that impacted upon crime were firstly the type of road layout um, that the house was based upon. So that's what we'd call a through road. So it's one way in for a vehicle and you can go out in a different way. Uh, one way in for a pedestrian and you can go out another way. That's what we call a true cul-de-sac uh, on the right. So a vehicle can go in one way and it's got to come out the way it came in. Uh, pedestrians can go in one way and they've got to come out the way that they came in. Um, this is what we'd call a leaky cul-de-sac. Uh, so vehicles can come in one way and go out the way they came in. But as you'll see, pedestrians can come in one way and they can go off on the, uh, the footpaths that you can see coming off. So basically a leaky cul-de-sac is a cul-de-sac that's got connecting footpaths going to other areas. Compared to a true cul-de-sac, through roads experienced 110%, oh no, no, 93% more crime, and leaky cul-de-sacs experienced 110% more crime. So this research showed that the safest um, layout of a housing development was a true cul-de-sac, and the least safe was a leaky cul-de-sac with through roads in the middle. Um, in line with loads of other uh, research, we found that corner plots experienced higher levels of crime than properties that were not a corner plot. And again, in line with lots of other research, we found that if a property was overlooked by three or more other properties, so if you had um, natural surveillance, then those houses experienced less crime as well. So I've run through the policy, I've run through the the evaluations that we have, or that I've done on SIPTED and Secure by Design. I'm now going to move on to the crux, or the, what I find the most interesting part of this uh, presentation, which I hope you do as well. Uh, so I've been conducting research in this field for a long time, and as far as I'm aware, there's been very little research asking the offenders what they think about SIPTED. So we have other research on other areas of crime prevention that talk to offenders about what they think, but in terms of SIPTED, unless you can tell me otherwise, there's not been a great deal of work asking those burglars whether we're doing this right. So for the last couple of years, I've been working on a research project with West Yorkshire Police where we have conducted interviews with a sample of 22 uh, prolific burglars currently serving a prison sentence in three prisons in the north of England. I know 22 sounds like a small sample, but these were really in-depth interviews and it's taken almost two years to get 22 burglars. So whilst we're still collecting data, I think that we're at a point where we can say that these findings are significant and they've got something to say, which hopefully you'll find interesting. Uh, when I say prolific burglars, um, these burglars were committing, before they were sentenced, between one and ten burglaries a day. Um, they ranged from their mid-twenties to their mid-fifties, 
and they'd all been committing burglaries since their early teens. One of them had been committing burglaries since he was eight years old. So they'd committed thousands of burglaries between them. Um, sometimes people criticise this and say that perhaps I'm interviewing unsuccessful burglars because they're in prison, so perhaps they're not very good and I'm getting the views of not very good burglars. Um, it, it's, it's a justified criticism. Well, I can say that the number of burglaries that these people were committing compared to the number that they were sentenced for suggests that I would call them extremely successful burglars. So take that on board as a criticism, but these, these guys have done absolutely loads of burglaries. So the interviews took place in prison, one-on-one, um, -on -one, face to face. They were voluntary, so they didn't have to take part in these interviews if they didn't want to. Um, we offered no incentives for them to take part. And the interviews took place post-sentencing, so there was no ability for them to use this as a bargaining tool in terms of the sentences that they had, which was important for me um, from an ethical perspective. So the method involved basically showing the burglars 16 photographs or images of housing, and I'll be showing you those images in a bit, and just asking them two questions. So we didn't have any individual prompts, no specific questions. We just said, from what you can see from this image, or what would attract you to this house if you were thinking about selecting it as a target for burglary, and looking at the image, what would deter you from selecting this as a house if you were thinking about committing a burglary? No prompts whatsoever. The houses, um, these are the 16 images, and again, I'll be showing you them throughout the presentation so you'll be able to see them much clearer. They were a mix of social housing and private housing, uh, new housing and older housing, and a mix of what I would consider to be a good SIPTED practice and some examples of what I'd consider to be poor SIPTED practice. Just a quick taster in case you're thinking about falling asleep uh, without giving any spoilers away. They did tell us that we're getting it right most of the time, um, but there are some elements that we really need to rethink in terms of SIPTED. And they also told us that in terms of SIPTED, we need to be looking beyond just simply trying to design criminals out. So that's a taster before I give you the findings. So I'm presenting the, the things that they told us here according to the themes of SIPTED. Just to remind you, we didn't ask them about the specific themes of SIPTED. We didn't say, what do you think about the surveillance? What do you think about the defensible space? Um, I think that would have been quite an interesting question. But I'm presenting it this way just because it makes it easier for you to see what they said about the principles. So just a reminder of what we say in England in terms of our guidance on informal or natural surveillance. So we say that um, the front of properties should be kept low uh, in terms of fences, hedges, walls, etc. Uh, planting or shrubbery mustn't impede natural surveillance, so you don't want trees blocking sight lines. And your houses should be positioned to face onto the street. The second one... Um, we say that if a house is um, adjacent to a vulnerable area, so that might be a footpath or an open space, um, we use the term uh, more robust defensive barriers. So this suggests that you should have a fence or a wall or, or whatever uh, to a minimum of 1.8 metres. So that's one of our requirements. So we showed them um, lots of images that we think would have pointed them in that direction. Again, we didn't ask them what they thought about the fences or the natural surveillance. So here we've got low fences, very open at the front of these properties. Here we have a house that has not got an open front. We've got an overgrown uh, shrubbery there, a high fence, a high gate. And here we have um, a traditional cul-de-sac where the houses all face onto the street. So you can see that they, they sort of circle around the cul-de-sac and look onto the street. So what did the offenders tell us about surveillance? Um, so they told us that they were attracted to limited visibility. Um, 
they didn't like the thought that they might be surveyed and they loved the thought that they wouldn't be surveyed. So here you've got some quotes which I'm not going to read out, which support um, what we say about informal and natural surveillance. The two on this side, the red and the yellow one, are basically referring to that house with the overgrown shrubbery, the overgrown hedge. They're basically saying that um, that blocks the view in terms of what a resident can see out onto the street. So in terms of how people can see them when they're on the street. And it also blocks the view from people on the street and other residents when they're in the house. So they feel safe once they're in there. It's a safe zone. Nobody can see them. They also told us that they... I'm just giving you some examples of quotes, by the way. This doesn't mean there was only one person saying that. Um, they didn't like the fact that they didn't like the idea of houses facing onto the street and the fact that people could see them, people could challenge them, uh, ring the police, contact a neighbour, come out, etc. So they were deterred by that fact that people were looking out or could be looking out onto the street. In terms of that reference to the true cul-de-sac, um, they didn't like the true cul-de-sac from a surveillance point of view because of the fact that when they go onto the cul-de-sac, um, whether they commit the burglary then or whether they decide that it's not the right place to commit a burglary, they would then have to come out the way that they went in. So there's a risk that people would see them, uh, challenge them, ask them what they're doing, etc. So from a surveillance point of view, they didn't like those true cul-de-sacs. But one of the things that we could potentially be doing wrong, or we are potentially doing wrong, just reminding you of that exception that I mentioned in terms of our guidance where we talk about having fences of 1.8 metres if you're abutting a footpath or a vulnerable space. The offenders told us that they love high fences, they love solid fences. Uh, whenever we showed them an image with high fences, they said that they would be attracted to it. Um, if you can see on the right hand side there, they told us if there were no fences, if it was exposed, that they would be deterred. So I think this is something that um, we really need to reconsider in terms of our implementation of SIP10 and something that I've fed back to secure by design. Physical security, um, so reminding you that we have the full section two of secure by design which sets really specific standards for locks, windows, doors, etc. And we also have those building regulations specific to physical security. We showed them images that pointed to physical security. So this one has a really poor quality lock, a really poor quality door. It also has tools in the garden that could be used to help them commit a burglary. This house has, again, a really poor quality door, but it has a burglar alarm. Again, we didn't ask them what they thought about the burglar alarm. We just showed them the image. And we have a house here which has um, bars and grills on the downstairs window and door. And no surprise um, for guessing that they told us that they don't like good quality locks. Um, but one of the most important things is that they could tell just from looking at that image whether or not that was a lock that they'd be able to get in. They were very astute, very aware of, of what they could do. I'm not sure if you, ha if you have a... Um, a modus operandi here called uh, mole gripping or lock snapping. Is that something that would be a problem? No. So we have a really, um, a really uh, large problem, particularly in West Yorkshire, where burglars use mole grips. Does anyone know what mole grips are? And they basically snap the front of the barrel off the lock and use a screwdriver to open the door. Um, it's a, it, I can't remember the percentage, but it accounts for a huge proportion of the modus operandi in the force that I live in, and particularly across the UK. So they told us that they could tell from looking at the images whether they'd be able to snap that lock, uh, whether they'd be able to mole grip it. Um, they told us whether or not they thought it was a, an easy door to get into. Um, I love that red quote there. The hinges on the outside of that door, or on the outside of the door, for God's sake, it's a cheap ass door, that one. Um, the yellow one, it, it, I love this quote because it basically says if manufacturers know that we can mole grip a lock, why don't they change the lock and make it harder to break in, which 
this complete common sense and is exactly what we are trying to do. So it was nice to hear that quote from an offender. Um, in line with uh, lots of other research, and I'd point you to some work that's going on at Loughborough University in England, uh, Professor Saloni, um, these burglars told us they were not deterred by burglar alarms at all. Um, they said basically that people won't respond to it. Um, they would either just risk the fact that it might go off and set themselves a time period at which they would get out. They, would, they said for particular alarms, when you break in, if you rip the alarm box off the wall, the alarm stops, so they'd go in and rip the box off. This guy was very inventive. He goes the day before and squirts the alarm with foam sealant and then goes back and burgles the day after, and so the alarm goes off, but nobody can hear it. So uh, burglar alarms were not working at all for our burglars. And they told us that they were attracted to excessive security, which is something that we would use for zip tied because the idea is that you don't need excessive security because you're designing it out before. Um, they were convinced that that house with the grills on was a, a cannabis farm, which makes the fact that me and a police officer were still taking images and photographs of it really quite embarrassing if it, if it was a cannabis farm. But, um, so they were attracted to so any kind of level of excessive security they felt there must be something worth taking these people are, are protecting something in this house so i'm going to go for this house but something that again we're not doing right and i've fed this back to secure by design and uh, steve and the national police chief council when we um in terms of the physical security when we conduct attack tests so in a, in a, a an environment in a factory environment where an engineer would attack that lock to check that it it's resistant to attack uh, the engineers use um, specific tools and they attack that lock or that door or that window for 15 minutes um, they do it in spells I think Steve will correct me they do it in spells of three minutes and then they might have a break three minutes change tools etc so it is a different environment to a burglar um, but these burglars were telling us which really surprised me that they would just take as long as needed to break into these houses. 15 minutes um, doesn't appear to be long enough in my view. They were referencing 30 minutes, 40 minutes. I just continue going until I get in, irrespective of, of how long it takes. I think one of them said he'd go off and get some tools from a neighbor's shed and come back and have another go. So they were really persistent. And I think that that's something that we have perhaps um, underestimated in terms of offenders this really surprised me so again we're feeding this back in terms of improving and reviewing our evidence through movement so again reminding ourselves uh, what we say about through movement so yes we acknowledge that you will need or you might want footpaths uh, through a housing estate but we say that they mustn't compromise security so you don't want excessive numbers of footpaths and we really advise against having footpaths that connect cul-de-sacs together and we also say that you should try to frustrate offenders searching behavior so don't have too many footpaths that make it easy for them to move between areas so we showed them lots of images of houses with footpaths this is like the worst footpath that i've ever seen in a housing development um, this actually got an award, not a Secure by Design award, it got a CABE, I don't know if anyone's heard of CABE, it's our sort of, um, they give awards for high quality developments and this actually had a CABE award. So this footpath, as you can see, it has bends so the offenders can hide within them, it's got high walls, it's dark, um, so this is a really bad footpath. We showed them quite a few images of footpaths. And they confirmed that they love through movement. Um, this was a really strong principle that came out from the offenders. Um, and one of the reasons that they loved the through movement was because they said it gives them a legitimacy. It gives them an excuse to be in the area. Um, and I absolutely love this quote, so I'm gonna read it out, even though that's a little bit boring. But when this offender saw the footpath, he said, yes, it's perfect, easy pickings. I first walk up and down the footpath, no one would give me a second glance. Even if I was a tramp walking up and down, I wouldn't look out of, foot, of place. 
It's a footpath, no one can question you. So the idea here is that if we're putting footpaths through housing estates, offenders who are walking up and down and rooting for whether or not they're going to commit a crime, they've got every reason to be there. If you want to challenge them, they can say that they're going to their friend's house, they're on the way to the shops. It's a legitimate reason to be there. So this was one of the responses. I didn't say this, honestly, I'm not faking it. This was a real burglar, so I, it couldn't be more perfect for me, that quote. Um, they also told us they love through movement because it allows them to evade or escape the police. So really obvious, but they said that um, they know how to use those footpaths to get in and out. They can do that quicker on foot than the police can get there in a car. So it's basically just giving them um, an easy way to get in and out of a development and through the development as well. And moving back to that cul-de-sac idea, they love through movement because it means they don't have to retrace their steps back out of the development. So if they go in, commit a crime, or they go in and they decide not to commit a crime, they don't have to come back out the way they came in. They can go a different way and there's less chance of somebody challenging them or noticing them or ringing the police. <coughs> Defensible space. Just reminding ourselves, again, we say that you should try and use um, a narrowing of the entrance to an estate, rumble strips, a change in road colour and texture, etc., to give that impression that you're entering a private area and this is somewhere that you shouldn't be going. And again, we showed them lots of images that pointed to what we would consider to be a good defensible space. Uh, as you can see here, you've got the change in road colour and narrowing in the entrance as you move into this estate. And they did tell us that they don't like the feeling on estates like that, that everybody will know each other, um, that they'll look out of place, uh, that everyone knows who should be in that area and who shouldn't be in that area. So, so um, that basically confirmed the, the concept of defensible space, that we're doing the right thing there. But, there's always a but, isn't there? I'm going to just go back to the image and remind you what it looks like. This is a secure by design development and it is actually a development that I take international visitors to, to show them how we do secure by design really well. If you notice there it says private road on the entrance to the estate. Secure by Design doesn't say right private road on the road, but the people who have implemented these, this guidance have interpreted it to say, let's write private road on the road, so they did. And the offenders loved it. They misinterpreted the concept completely there. Um, almost all of them said that private written on that street meant that they were private houses, that they weren't social houses. Um, I'm not sure why they thought that, but they basically said private road means they've bought the houses, you don't get rented properties on a private road. Almost all of them said that. They also interpreted private written on the road to mean that this was as an exclusive area, that the people would have things to steal, that they'd have money, etc. So we were getting it completely wrong there, and the burglars loved that housing estate. So again, I fed this back to Secure by Design. And finally, the concept of management and maintenance. We, it's a difficult one. I think Garner referred to it yesterday. It's a difficult one. It's difficult to um, put guidance in place for a development going forward. So Secure by Design just basically suggests that in terms of communal spaces and planting, you need a management system in place to keep the area tidy so that it doesn't become overgrown or too much litter and graffiti. And we showed them images that pointed to good management and maintenance and also poor management and maintenance. You can decide whether or not you think that that was good or bad, depending on your view of housing. And a couple of them did confirm what we think about management and maintenance. So a couple of them said that poor management and maintenance would equate to a lack of care. So the yellow quote is what we, what I, from reading the theories, 
and working in this field would think we want them to think so yeah they're sloppy which means that they might have left the keys in the door or they might have even left the door open and conversely that good management and maintenance means that you've got a vigilant person living there so the blue or purple one it's manicured so someone takes time to look after it and they're probably looking out for people like me coming along so a few of the offenders did confirm what we think about management and maintenance but again we have another but the majority of them did not interpret management and maintenance the way that we think they would the majority of them um the majority decided that um if you have a, a scruffy area it means that people don't don't care and that there's going to be nothing worth taking so in terms of i'm just going to let you read those quotes and laugh They're quite funny, aren't they? So, um, <laughs> so they, they interpreted the fact that the, um, the reward for burgling these houses wouldn't be worth the risk. So they, they were just a complete no on these houses. Um, we've got a really considerate burglar there on the green one. This is such a Yorkshire one here, isn't it? This, uh, they, they aren't going to have out. I don't know if you know the... Well, you do know the Yorkshire accent because I have it, but, um, yeah, these were Yorkshire burglars. Um, but, for again, another book, for those who like gardening, um, they basically told us if you have a tidy garden, if you look after the area, that you're going to have things worth taking, um, that it'll be worth burgling you because you'll have the things to take. So, the yellow one, the gardens are dirty and horrible, it put me off... You want a nice tidy garden if you mow your lawn, you care for your house and you'll have nice things. So crime prevention lesson number one, don't mow your lawn, which is quite nice for me to think about. So again, on a serious note, this is something that um, listening to the offenders is basically telling us things that I've been doing this for 20 years, that I had not interpreted this this way. And again, it's really important to feed that evidence back into the way that we do what we do in the UK. Right, okay. So, very briefly summarising the principles of SIPTED and the number of references to that principle. Uh, obviously, we didn't expect the offender to start talking about defensible space or informal surveillance. So, here we've basically interpreted it as a reference to that concept in whatever way. Um, and you'll see that surveillance and physical security were the most referenced, they were the most important for those burglars. The concept of defensible space was not. Only 36% of them mentioned that concept. Uh, and this is something that we are going to explore in the UK, given the cuts that we have to this service, whether or not we need to consider weighting these principles um, and whether they focus on the ones that are most important. So, coming to an end. The offenders did reference the existing SIPTED principles, some more than others, and some in a different direction to what we anticipated. But they also revealed a lot more to me about the impact of design of place and space on their decision making. And certain of the, a certain number of those images uh, evoked an emotional or a moral attachment to the area that they stated would deter them. Um, and I think this suggests that SIPTED is basically missing something and that we should be considering crime prevention uh, from a much broader perspective. So I'm going to just very quickly il illustrate what I mean here. So we showed them this image and we expected them to comment on the low fences, the open gardens, the fact that it was terraced housing. Only six of the 22 burglars would burgle these houses. Uh, and the reasons that they gave were purely based upon moral and emotional responses. Um, they said they wouldn't burgle it because they interpreted it as being social housing. These people are on benefits and that would be morally wrong to do that. But for me, a really interesting finding that's coming out of this is that quite a few of them referenced the fact that they wouldn't burgle there because they, they felt it reminded them of where they grew up. It reminded them of where their family lives. It reminded of, of their own area. So I'd stay away from here because it's the kind of area I grew up in. You don't shit in your own backyard, basically. Um, I'd never burgle my own was another one. So this is a really interesting finding that, that came out of this for me. 
Um, another one here, we expected comments on those low fences and the open frontage. One of the 22 burglars would burgle this housing estate. And again, the reasons were all moral and emotional attachment to the area. So they interpret it as being old people's housing, sheltered housing for the disabled. And again, you had reference to reminding them of where their gran lived. They, they felt it wasn't the right thing to do. So what does this tell us? Um, it could tell us one of two things, um, and they both have risks whether or not we take it on board or we don't. It could tell us that offenders' narratives don't reflect reality. Um, this is something that Ken Peace referred to as a false morality, that they say they do one thing and they do a completely different thing. We know that social housing is one of the most vulnerable sectors. Um, they say they wouldn't burgle social housing, so somebody's burgling social housing. Um, it could be that they feel guilty after the event and they were telling me what they thought I wanted to hear. It could be that they were appealing for leniency, even though I said that they would, it would have no impact on the criminal justice system. Or, and I like to be positive, and I, I don't think this is naive, I think we have something here. It could tell us that however low, offenders do have morals and they do have standards, and that they do feel an attachment to certain areas based on a visual cue that reminds them of where they live, where they grew up. And that there is a possibility of exploring that emotional attach attachment as a means of deterrence. So just to please, Rick, I'm going to round up here. I'm concluding by saying that we have treated the offender as peripheral in this debate. Uh, we've treated them as peripheral in terms of an expert on the subject. We haven't consulted with them. And we've learned a lot from talking to these offenders. We've treated them as peripheral from a geographical perspective. Um, SIPTED has basically focused on treating offenders as external to the area um, and designing them out of the area, when actually we know that offenders live in the same community, the same street, often the same house, if it's a house of multiple occupancy, as we do. We know that they travel very short distances to commit burglary, so why has SIPTED simply focused on designing them out? Why have we not thought a little bit wider about this issue? So I'm arguing that we need to shift the emphasis of SIPTED slightly, um, continue doing what we're doing, but rather than treating offenders purely as external outsiders to be designed out of the area, that we think about designing places and spaces that reduce their propensity or desire to actually commit a crime. So if you think about the factors that influence offending, and SIPTED is purely based on opportunity theories, if you think about factors that influence an offender's uh, route into crime, drug use, mental health, emotional attachment, social cohesion, could we try and build on these and move towards something a little bit more akin to crime prevention through pro-social design? And I love this quote from a book which is not specific to this subject, but I think it really summarises how SIPTED should be moving in that direction. And as luck would have it, I am editing a special edition of the Journal of Social Sciences on the subject of crime prevention through pro-social design. And if anybody would like to submit a paper on this subject, then please get in touch with me. So concluding, we have treated offenders as peripheral, as offenders that we need to keep out, and as experts with an influence on policy and practice. We need to ask them more. Then we need to listen to what they say, whether or not it fits with what we want them, what we want to hear. And we need to then respond and ensure that what they say is influencing our policy and our practice. So, sorry I rushed at the end. Thank you very much for your time. Sorry. Rick.